Well, it's a truly a great pleasure to welcome everybody to tonight's very special webinar with our very distinguished guest of honor, Major General Yarkov Amidrol. We've had the pleasure on several occasions at AJAC to host the General in Australia, always uh, scintillating visits and great presentations that he brings with him. And of course, it's a true pleasure for the double whammy here that uh, uh, Yarkov is the Anne and Greg Ross Handler Senior Fellow at the uh, highly respected GIST, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Um, as Joel said, uh, the General has an impeccable record uh, and a truly uh, impressive uh, career, uh, both in the IDF where you rose to the highest levels, especially in the areas of intelligence, uh, and since as a very respected analyst and author, a truly formidable, highly authoritative record. Uh, Yarkov Amadraw is just the expert we need to explain to us the profound changes that are taking place across the Middle East particularly strategically in terms of the ongoing realignments and the security transformations that are unfolding across the Middle East on a daily basis. And we're particularly concerned as to how these changes, of course, affect Israel's situation, its security in particular, and how it's navigating these new changes, the calculations it's making on this changed strategic landscape. And it's changing so rapidly so we're truly privileged to have General Amadraw with us the evening to discuss this uh, very pressing, extremely important topic at this crucial time in world events. General Amador, Yaakov, my friend, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Colin, very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you know, in the last um, months, I was twice in uh, Washington, twice in Dubai. Um, one in Mumbai, once in Mumbai, and now in Australia without moving from my kitchen. So it's a, it's a very nice uh, situation. No jet lag at all. Um, I can concentrate on my work and at the same time to visit so many places and to meet so many uh, people. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak about this subject because it is very um, important for us in Israel to understand what are real changes and what is just, you know, a wind which will uh, disappear tomorrow. Um, first, we have to remember there are some geopolitical facts that cannot be ignored, haven't been changed, and probably will not be changed. Israel will remain a little country. Um, it's, um, I remember in my, one of my visits uh, in Australia, I came with my wife to uh, Sydney and I told her that when we are entering the, the, the area of, of Sydney, the airport of Sydney on the other side of the city is, uh, the, the range is more than the depths of Israel within the green line. Um, and, and, and Israel will remain little. We will remain only uh, six, seven, eight, all the Australian Jews will come to Israel, all the Americans will come, we will be, 10 million Jews in, in, in Israel and, and surrounded by um, hundreds of millions. So the, the, the issue of, of, of um, how to call it, the, the disbalancing and the, the, the um, asymmetry that Israel is facing relating to all these uh, facts that can be measured um, will remain there. And, we will have to bridge the gap by keeping our qualitative age. Without it, we cannot cope with the uh, area around us because we will remain little. We will have to deal with the asymmetries and there is no any other solution to bridge it but by keeping the qualitative age first. Second, we, something will not change dramatically uh, in our relations with the countries surrounding us. I'm calling it, we cannot reach the Berlin of the Middle East. I mean, we know that it, it is not in our hands to change the political situation of the Middle East. All the countries around us are non-democratic countries. It will remain. 
Many of them are very much corrupted, dysfunctioning, um, and it will remain an issue in the Middle East and so on and so forth. We cannot change the Middle East, even if we win the war and we will reach all the capitals of countries around us. We cannot change the Middle East. It's not like the, the, the allies who came into Berlin and changed the Europe. It is not in our hands. It means that we will have to prepare ourselves for the next round whenever we will finish the previous one. Doesn't matter how successful will be the war, the next one will come. When, we don't know. We have to postpone it as much as possible with political means, with military means, whatever is needed, but it will come. And last but not least, um, the, the central gravity of Israel will remain very little around Tel Aviv area, very close to the borders of Israel. And Israel will remain without too many um, um, areas which cannot be reached by missiles and, and, and from, from, from outside. To, in today, missiles and, and, and um, capabilities of Hezbollah and Hamas there is no even one area that they cannot reach. And we will have to think all the time about the, the infrastructure of Israel, how we find enough capabilities that will remain untacked, although they will launch their uh, missiles and rockets into Israel. So it is an issue of combination between geography and the ability of Israel to survive the attack and to continue um, to, to act under fire of uh, precise missile. And, and it is not going to be changed. There is no any solution. Uh, we can uh, find some ways to minimize it, but the problem will remain. Israel do not have too many um, infrastructure uh, capabilities because we are solid and we cannot spread it around. These three facts will remain. But there are some big changes that we will have to, to see what are the results. First of all, internationally, as in Australia, the picture is different than what we had a few years ago. The um, tension between China and the United States of America is leading to Israel to a place that Israel will have to make decisions. And no, no question what will be the answer. The answer to the question in which side you are standing is very clear. We are in the American side. There is no substitute to the relations that Israel has with the United States of America. And if we will have to make decisions to keep the Chinese out of our systems, uh, to uh, minimize their um, involvement in Israel infrastructure and so on and so forth, the answer is very clear. By the way, we are very open with the Chinese, and we are telling them that Israel has an agreement with, with the United States of America. We are not selling the Chinese military system, not dual use technology, and, and they understand that at the end of the day, if decision um, will have to be taken, um, it will be very clear what Israel will, but they, they, we understand that the whole atmosphere of the international community was was uh, was changed. One very important factor is that there is no any international institution that can make decision and that you can apply into it if you have a problem. When you know um, uh, you see the countries which are becoming members of the human rights um, executive, you understand that. It is a joke. I mean, you cannot apply to the United Nations. And, and we understand that Israel is the only Jewish state facing um, 22 Arab states, 54, 57 uh, Muslim states, um, countries which uh, will not uh, support Israel, whatever will be the situation. As an example, we never had been members of the Security Council and probably in the foreseen uh, future will not be. So we understand. We have to 
to do whatever we is needed for Israel without taking into account any support from any international institution. Uh, and with the tension between China and, and, and America, it's even more so because they are neutralizing each other in the Security Council. There is no way that Israel will get any support in the United, uh, in the United Nations. In the Middle East itself, there are a very a uh, few phenomena which are changing the, the whole atmosphere. First of all, um, Iran is still there, try to reach the point in which they can produce a nuclear military capability. They didn't stop the efforts. They continue with the long range missile because according to the agreement, it is not forbidden. They continue with the R&D of the new generation of centrifuges and they are very, um, much near the point in which they can use it. Um, they have now more enriched uranium um, uh, materials than before the agreement. And they are looking and um, watching what is happening in the United States of America. Their expectations are that Biden will win and they will find a way uh, to go back to a situation in which there are no sanctions on them because their economy is devastating. But Iran is still there in their efforts to reach the military nuclear capability. At the same time, they try to build around Israel a ring of fire. Israel is very active to prevent it in Syria. Israel is less active to prevent it in um, Western uh, Iraq. But the logic of Iranian is very clear. To bring, to bring their capabilities near to Israel, to build the ring of fire based on what they have in Lebanon, what they want to have in Syria and Western Iraq, and at the same time to keep Tehran far away, very secure, so they will have all the capabilities close to Israel and we will not have these capabilities close to Iran. One remark, the new relations with the Gulf countries is changing this situation because it's first time in history that Israel will have um, connection, positions, capabilities close to Iran. And for the Iranians, it's not just a diplomatic issue, it is also a strategic military issue. How far we will cooperate with the Gulf countries, how far they will be ready to help us, how far we will, they will be ready to to uh, work together in this area, um, to, to combine military efforts, it's, it's a big question. But for the Iranians, the fact that Israel has a position um, in the other side of the Gulf, either in Bahrain or in the Emirates, and tomorrow, God knows where, for them it's a huge problem because the whole strategic plan of the Iranians was that they will move their capabilities close to Israel. And this is the effort that we are doing in Syria in the last few years to prevent it. And, is, and at the same time, Iran will remain far away from Israel and it will be a huge problem to, to get to, to Iran. So this is one issue that we, we, we have to deal with. It is, as in the past, it, is, it didn't intensify. They, they, after the, the assassination of Soleimani, it is even more problematic for the Iranians, but the problem is still there. The second issue is a big difference from the past. Um, the Turks became much more um, active and, and are pushing all around the Middle East. It is their involvement in Syria. It is their involvement in Libya. It is their uh, attempt to make the uh, Mediterranean um, um, a Turkish sea with an agreement with the uh, one part of the of the administration in in, in Libya. They are spreading the, the the Mediterranean between Turkey and 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 Libya, ignoring Cyprus, Greece, and and so and so forth. And for us, it's a huge problem because we want to connect ourselves to Europe, free the Mediterranean. What will be the reaction of the of the um, Turks when they will um, claim that we are entering to their EEZ? A huge problem. 
a very active um, uh, um, country now with huge uh, economic problem, but at the same time with the um, probably in the future uh, huge uh, um, uh, capabilities to produce gas and so and so. They found a big field in the Black Sea. It will take a few years, but Turkey is a new factor, negative factor in the Middle East that we will have to take into account when we speak about the future of, of the relations of Israel within the Middle East. They are representing the idea of the Muslim Brotherhood. They are hosting Hamas in Istanbul. Hamas is now acting from Turkey against Israel. They gave a Turkish citizenship to leaders of Hamas so they will be immune from assassination because they believe that Israel will not kill Turkish uh, citizens. Um, it's a huge negative force in the in today Middle East, not just from our point of view, from the Egyptian, Egyptian point of view, from the Emirates point of view. The relations with Qatar are uh, very important economically for the for the text, but very important for Qatar to prevent any attempt by the Gulf countries to, to act against uh, Qatar. Turkey became a huge problem. This is one uh, new effect in the Middle East that we have to take into, uh, into consideration. Um, as I mentioned, the Mediterranean is becoming more and more important for Israel. We have a new area which is as big as Israel. This is our easy in the Mediterranean. Uh, the line was agreed with the Cyprus. Um, we are now at the beginning of negotiations when we maybe it will be agreed with the Lebanese. There, are, there is an area there of dispute between us and Lebanon. Um, but for Israel, it's a new element. We have a huge area to defend. All our gas is in the Mediterranean. Um, many projects of desalination uh, from which we are getting the uh, drinking water for Israel. So the Mediterranean, the, the, the way to defend our facilities in the, in the, in the sea be, are becoming more and more important for the future of Israel. Strategically, it is a new phenomenon. Israel does not have any experience with such a situation in which the, the sea is so important. We, were, we had been and we will be very much dependent on the ability to transfer uh, um, goods from um, through the Mediterranean, from Gibraltar to Israel, because all the connections of Israel with Europe, America, and so on, and all the other places other than the, the, the Far East, is and in Australia are through the Mediterranean. But the fact that so much of Israel energy and water is in the Mediterranean is a new phenomenon. We are expanding our navy. You hear the voices about it in, in, in the newspapers. Um, and we will have to do probably even more in the, in the, in the future because the EZ in the Mediterranean is becoming more important for the economy and the ability of Israel to, to have the water and energy with Israel. Uh, some of it will be exported, but most of it will be used inside Israel. Israel is now independent uh, relating to its energy. We are, um, uh, we are buying oil around the world, but if we be in need, we can be totally independent. So um, in the Mediterranean itself, there is a new phenomenon, which from our point of view is very positive. We have much better relations and even kind of alliances and agreements with the Mediterranean countries, with Greece, um, uh, Cyprus, relating to energy, it is including also the Egyptians. Um, and I believe that based on the, um, on the relations relating to energy and it will lead to security relations because we will have all the four countries, the interest to defend and to secure the Mediterranean from any uh, problems because um, most of the energy of Egypt is in the same basin. Um, and the um, connections to Europe through uh, Cyprus and Greece are very important for both uh, countries. And as I said, Turkey is one problem. Issues of terrorism is another problem. What will happen in, in Libya 
it's a big question. Turkey is very much involved there. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity, it's a problem, but at the same time, it's a huge opportunity for Israel to build new relations with new countries and to be more involved relating to uh, Israel-European Union relations. Um, so I think it's, it's very important phenomena um, which will have an influence in the, in the, um, in the future. In the um, operational level, the most problematic issue that Israel is facing is the ability of Hezbollah and the Iranians to lynch accurate missiles into Israel. Um, it is, this is endangering the um, infrastructure of Israel. Uh, it's a huge problem from our point of view. Um, we don't have too many substitutes to the very few um, centers of infrastructure that we have in Israel. Um, and and we, we have to invest a lot of money relating to the issue of defending Israel from um, uh, missile capabilities. As you know, we have uh, three and a half layers of active defense. It's Arrow 3 and Arrow 2, which is one and a half uh, layer. We have David Sling, and under that we have Iron Dome. In the future, probably we will have a fourth layer based on laser capabilities. It is, it, it, it was not matured enough to be used, but we are working very hard on that. Um, and we are investing a lot of money, not just in, in, in active uh, defense, but also in passive, uh, passive defense, that every family in Israel will have a security room in which they can go in, um, in time of, of, um, of, um, of, uh, of a war. Um, and this is very important to have the ability to, to secure the civilians in Israel as well as the infrastructure and the military uh, it's a huge effort. In the last few years, we invested, I think, around $10 billion on that. Probably we will have to do the same investment in the future. Um, but today, at the end, Israel will be in much better position to deal with the new threat which emerged from the new technology of um, preciseness. And then the, the other side has it, and we are doing whatever is needed to improve our targeting capabilities and to have more and more precise weapon systems that can deal with this, uh, with this uh, uh, threat. Today, Israel does not have um, the classical threat that we faced when I was young. The only real army which still exists uh, near Israel is the Egyptian army very modern one, big one in numbers, but the Egyptians have other problems. They are facing uh, problems in Libya. Um, they don't like the fact that Turkey is there very strong. They have problems with Ethiopia, which is um, da build a huge dam on the Nile and will prevent the water from going down into Egypt, huge problem from the Egyptians point of view. Uh, they are facing uh, strong uh, Al-Qaeda forces in the Sinai Peninsula. We try to help them there as much as uh, possible. They didn't find a solution yet to the problem and, and the Egyptian army is there, but um, modern and, and strong. But as I said, uh, today we are cooperating with Egypt and Egypt of today is not an, is not an enemy might be changed in the future and we will have to be prepared ourselves. But this is the only, um, this is the only real classical army which still exists in the Middle East around the Israel, the Syrian army uh, killed itself in the, in the, in the war uh, within Syria. Um, the Iraqi army does not exist. Um, Jordan is, is very little and not modern army, they are very, cooperation between us and the Jordanians is in a very high level. Uh, we try to help them to deal with their problems. Um, this is an issue which is very important for Israel. The stability of, of Jordan is very important. There's one, um, one issue that I want to, to, um, 
to uh, to mention and then to open it to uh, questions as you as you ask. One is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a very important country. They are now in a very difficult time. They are transferring the control of the state from the second generation, the sons of the founder, to the third generation, to the grandsons. They don't have any experience um, and tradition how to do it. So it's a very delicate uh, situation in the history of Saudi Arabia. If uh, the present um, deputy uh, Prince, the um, um, Mohammed bin Suleiman succeed to gain the control and to have his in his hands without um, strong opposition from within. It will be very important for the future of the state. Um, I think that some of the uh, very hesitating steps that they that they are taking and the fact that they are not joining the trend in the in the Gulf like the Emirate is very much connected to the to this problem that they are facing. Uh, the prince has to be very cautious not to lose legitimacy by uh, going too far with Israel. Although the support of Saudi Arabia to these steps of Bahrain and the Emirate is very, very clear. Uh, some of the princes like uh, um, are doing it and saying it publicly, we don't afraid. Uh, Bandar Ben Sultan was very clear about it. Um, and, and we have to see what will happen there and if the Saudis will join the, the, the steps of the Emirates and Bahrain, that will be a huge change. Um, it, is, it is a big change today, the fact that the Emirates are ready to cooperate with Israel, um, profoundly uh, change the situation here. The uh, Palestinians begin to understand that they are losing the train. Um, I argued a few, a few years ago in the Washington Institute, Rob, Rob, Rob Setlop, I had will speak with you, very, 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 very smart guy. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to meet in the, in the Institute, um, Turkey Ben Faisal, one of the the, the grandsons, the, one of the oldest. And uh, I told him, why do you give the key for the future of the Middle East the, to the Palestinians? It's a huge mistake. Take the key from them and the price will be reduced. Now they have the key because they are stopping you from going with Israel. And, and you have to pay twice. First for the solving the problems between the Palestinians and Israel. And then that they will allow the, the Arab world to go ahead with Israel take the, the, the key from them and the, the price will be reduced. You see some signs um, behind the curtains within the Palestinian society that Palestinians begin to understand that if they will not join, they will miss the, the train. What will be the results? Abu Mazen is there and he's not letting them to, 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 to make the needed uh, steps. What will happen after him? The question. But people there understand that they, are, that they are losing the opportunity. Um, so for us, the, the new formal relations with the Emirates and Bahrain, and maybe next week with the Sudan, we change the whole landscape of the Middle East. We will not be surrounded anymore in every area with hostile countries. Um, it will be a two, year, two hours um, a short flight to Australia, I believe, um, and so and so forth. I mean, new relations in the economy, in the in the uh, in, um, in the foreign relations, and at the end, in security as well. That is, will be very cautious steps by both sides. But at the end, they, they, all of that is under the understanding, and this is my last. Um, a sentence, the understanding that the whole Middle East is going to be different because the American umbrella is, is not disappearing, but the Americans want to be less and less involved. It's a very problematic situation for the area. It's a very problematic situation for many countries which count on the Americans when it is coming to their ability to be to, um, Defend them to defend themselves. This is why Israel has huge opportunity here. 
relating to those relations with these countries, which will look for another um, anchor of stability in the area, and Israel might be the one. And it might change our relations with the United States of America, because the Americans will have to think, okay, whom can we trust in an area from which we want to less be involved? And if Israel will be the agreed answer, it will change the character of relations between us and the United States of America, because Israel will be accepted not just by countries in the area, but also by Washington as the one which has more responsibilities than in the past. And for America, this um, ability of Israel to be more involved is very important factor in the abilities of the Americans to uh, make what they call the um, pivot to the East. They need someone here. They cannot ignore the Middle East totally. So some Americans will remain here. Some forces will remain here. But at the end, Israel might be one very important part of the American solution to the question, okay, who will be responsible for the stability in the Middle East? Israel is not ready yet to take this burden. I'm not sure that the Israelis understand that there is a price, no free lunch. Um, but this is a big difference from the past. Israel is more, in, 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 relations with Israel are more important for many Arab countries than these relations are important for Israel, unlike in the past. And for the Americans, it might be the only solution to the question, okay, who will be responsible for the stability in the Middle East? Uh, so strategically, operationally, uh, these are the new phenomena that we have to, to look for and to understand and to act within. Um, I didn't speak about the domestic issue with Israel. It's not my, uh, um, I'm, I'm not a specialist to, to those issues, uh, but now I'm open to questions. Uh, whatever you Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, I will now like to hand over for the first question to Colin Rubenstein. Surprise. We don't hear you. You're good, Colin. Now, now you can hear me, I hope. So look, uh, the hour is late, so I'll be very quick, but thanks for that the very cogent and a very illuminating overview of what's happening. Uh, outstanding. So just to give you an opportunity to briefly elaborate on three of the points you made. And uh, one is simply, as you say, uh, as you said, the Israel, uh, Bahrain and uh, UAE Sudan normalization agreements, hopefully more. Uh, th this is a game changing situation. You mentioned several of the national security implications for Israel, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Perhaps you could mention uh, maybe uh, other other aspects of, uh, of this uh, development. Secondly, you mentioned potential future conflict, uh, not only with Iran, but with its proxy Hezbollah and its huge missile arsenal. As you said, I mean, the, the name of the game here, the worry is their attempts to fit precision guidance as so many of those missiles. Uh, to what extent really is Israel succeeding in its efforts to prevent this Iran Hezbollah precision guidance project from making those missiles so much more dangerous. And third and last, you referred also to the emerging Eastern Mediterranean, looking not only becoming so important in energy and strategic terms, but unfortunately becoming an area of, of conflict. Uh, thanks maybe to European incompetence, American indifference and unrelenting Turkish aggression, I think in your words. Uh, you, you've, you've commented that Israel is starting to prepare uh, for such an outcome, particularly to protect its offshore gas infrastructure. Um, what's the message you would like to give to the United States, Europe, and leaders in this country too, in trying to prevent such conflict development? Three points. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the, the normalization is very, is very significant. We worked very hard on that when we begin <clears throat> to think about it and to act, uh, to achieve it. So many people in the world explain to us that it's impossible. Without the Palestinians, they will not do it. And we worked very hard 
um, directly and indirectly um, um, to achieve this uh, goal. And, and, and I must say that the Prime Minister was the, the leading force within the system uh, when so many people didn't believe. Um, I think that there are three areas in which it is very important. One is the um, foreign relation, foreign relation, uh, relations and symbolic issue. Here is the acceptance of the Jewish state legitimacy to exist in the Middle East within an area which is other surrounded by only Arab and Muslim countries from Gibraltar to India. Remember that uh, in 67, they, <coughs> they sit in, in, in Khartoum and say no negotiation, no, <coughs> no legitimation, uh, no peace. And now Khartoum is joining the train. Um, it will open for Israel new areas in the international community, some, some places in which we will, um, in, in my automatic minority, if all these uh, countries will join Israel in the international community, it will change the balance of power within the international community. It will be easier for other, for other countries to join because they, they, they will see that there are Arab countries which are joining, so why don't they? And it's happening in Africa today. And so the whole structure of our foreign relations slowly, slowly will, be, will erode the, 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 the barriers around Israel and will let other countries to cooperate. And if it will be determined this uh, case, Israel will be determined with a lot of help from the American administration, of course, we cannot do it by ourselves. Um, uh, Israel will change its um, uh, situation within the international community. This is one area. It's a combination of international relations and the symbolic acceptance of Israel. The second area is the economy. They have many, many needs that Israel can provide. Think about Sudan. How Israel capabilities, knowledge, know-how, technology, and experts can transfer it from a country in which the people are starving to be the one which will provide food for the whole area. And food security in the Arab world and many parts of Africa is the main issue and cooperation between, and Sudan it's a very good example because they have water, they don't have the water in the right place and they don't have the technology to transfer and how to use it and so on and so forth. With the Emirate money, Israel technology and know-how and, and, and Sudan in, um, land and, and water, we can transfer this country totally to another area instead of being one of the poorest one to be the one which provided um, food to the Arabs on the other side in the Arab Peninsula in which they are facing huge problem of, of, of food security. And this is one, one example. Think about energy. Think about a pipeline going through Saudi Arabia into, um, into Elat and then using the um, Elat uh, uh, Ashkelon pipeline bypassing the need to go through the um, Persian Gulf. And the, the Iranians are losing the ability to stop the flow of oil because it will go with a pipeline through the um, Saudi Arabia directly into Elat. And what, what can the Iranians can do? And we have the pipeline from Elat to, to Ashkelon, it is there, used in the past by the Iranians, by the way. So there are many civilian areas connected to economy, energy, agriculture, whatever you have in mind, that we can work together and this cooperation can change the Middle East. If to quote Tukel Faisal in our meeting in the Washington Institute uh, three or four years ago, I'm quoting what he said. He said, General, with your money, in our mind, we can change the Middle East. And yes, with the cooperation of what we have and what they have, we can change the Middle East. And this is about economy. And the third one, which is, um, will be very slowly probably, and will be very, everyone will be very cautious and 
They will be the last one to be on the table is cooperation relating how to contain countries like Turkey and Iran, which are threatening the interest of both. Um, I can tell you that the, the Emirates are very much involved today in Libya. They try to help the, the Egyptians. Um, it is our interest that they will succeed. And the same about other issues. Of course, Iran is the first one. So these are the three areas in which it can make the difference. But there are some issues which we don't think, but they're, they're there. I mean, flying over Sudan um, to the south will make the journey to South um, um, America easier for every um, traveler from Israel. It will be shorter, at least in two hours. And the same is about flying over Saudi Arabia and the Emirates into, um, into uh, South Africa and, 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 and Australia. We will not have to go to Australia through uh, Hong Kong. We can do it through the Emirates. That's much easier. Very interesting. One direction through the Emirates, one direction through Hong Kong. Interesting all over the world. I mean, this is our, the less important, but you know, it's part of the new life that the Israelis will face in the new circumstances and should be exploited by, by Israelis as, as much as possible. By the way, um, one of the, the most important hubs for Israelis today to go outside Israel over the world is uh, Istanbul. Um, the Turks had, I think, 70 weekly flights from Israel to Istanbul. And most of the Israelis didn't go to Turkey. That was the hub through which they went to the Far East and so on and so forth. Um, many of these flights will be moved to the Emirates. And Emirates, the, the, in, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai, will be the, the hub for Israelis to the Far East and, and the South and so on and so forth. So um, it, it will change many areas. It will change the Middle East in many aspects. But the most important is the foreign relations, economy, and security. Um, the next question, um, I can elaborate less, but I can say that the Israeli success to prevent the Iranians from building um, the new element of independent Iranian war machine in Syria will be learned in the future as one of the great success of the military system of Israel. It is not zero, but out of the 100% that they wanted to have today, they have, I don't know, I don't know how to measure it, but probably 10 or 20%. We worked very hard, very intensively. We took many risks, but that was a huge success operation. The problem is that we will have to maintain it in the future and there is no guarantee that the success that we had in the past will remain with us in the future because we, we don't stop it. But up till now, uh, it is, it, it's a big success. Uh, we, I, I think that we have the same level of success preventing the Iranians from moving uh, part of these capabilities to manufacture precise weapon systems into Lebanon. This is more um, sophisticated and, and problematic situation because we don't want to push Hezbollah into a war now, but in many measures that had been taken, most of them um, in the, when, the, when the tools were in, in, in Syria, we succeeded to prevent the majority of this attempt. How many they have, it's a big question for the intelligence. Much, 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 much less than what they had in mind to have towards the end of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, again, it's an effort that should be continued because uh, they continue to try and we will have to continue to stop them. Um, but up to now, it's it can be declared as, as a huge success. The problem is that, that it's no guarantee for tomorrow morning. It's a huge problem for us, and we have to invest in, in active and, and passive uh, um, uh, capabilities. 
to prevent it from reaching the target, and then if it reached the target, to to um, to destroy it. it. It's a very costly effort. As I told you, I think that we invested up to now more than ten billion dollar, and we will have to invest the same amount of money in the future, at least the same amount of the amount of uh, money in the future. It's changing infrastructure within the IDF. Um, many uh, very uh, important uh, um, or very uh, distinguished uh, uh, people, which in the past could go to the infantry and the armor and so on and so forth, are now allocated to to these uh, forces. Um, it is easier because we can bring in many women, and they are taking a very important p uh, part in this effort. It's not part of uh, not the uh, armor uh, brigade, in which it is much more complicated to uh, integrate women. In, the, um, in this uh, area, we have many uh, commanders which are women and are doing fantastic job. Um, but still, it's it's a big effort with the connected to allocating of uh, budget and uh, very uh, capable. Uh, uh, men and women, uh, in this case, women and men. Um, and we have to, to continue it. It's, 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 it's be very costly in the future as well, because we understand the level of threat that it is uh, bringing into the situation of us and um, of Israel, uh, now and in the future. The next stage will be laser. When we succeed, and we will, to build the laser weapon that will make difference mainly in the close range ability of Israel to defend itself. Uh, the every uh, pulling of trigger will be uh, much cheaper, although the tool itself is, is, is expensive and you need many systems around uh, 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 locations which are important like around Gaza or, uh, or some infrastructure uh, centers and so on and so forth. Uh, because at the end it's electricity, it's not so, um, the hardware is, is, is much more expensive of the, all of these uh, interceptors. Laser is much cheaper, but there are many limitations to, to, um, to laser. Uh, and we will have to combine it within the systems. It will take a few years, but it will give us another layer of capabilities. About Turkey and the and the Mediterranean, look uh, for us, it's a new opportunity as well as a new threat. Um, the JISS is one of the promoters of the relations and um, and alliances with countries in the in the Mediterranean. We did it when it was very very premature. We um, we believe that they, this is something that Israel should do. Um, and, and we are promoting it now as well. It is connected to uh, investing money in um, bridging the Mediterranean. So Israel will be connected. Seems that we've just lost the general there. I'll. Uh... Just see if we can get him back. Stand by. Seems that we've completely lost his connection there. General, can you hear me? Whilst we're still waiting to get the general, and I'll have Ariel just uh, message him to see if we can get him back. Just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, look, we are uh, at, uh, we're, we're beholden to the technology of the day. Um, so we'll see if we can get the general back for some final remarks, but in the meantime, I'll take the liberty to advertise our next webinar, which will be next Thursday, the 5th of November. It will be a daytime webinar at noon with Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Dr. Oh, you Bob hear me? Fatlov. I can hear you, General. You're back. Oh, yes. I'm, I, I'm here all the time. You are back. Ah, ah, great. Now I can hear you. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> So I said that the uh, we are we promoted the relations with the with the um, with the uh, Mediterranean uh, East Mediterranean countries, 
And, and I believe that this is one of the big opportunities of Israel. It will change the character of our relations with the European Union. We became much more closer to the European Union. Israel will be connected uh, in its electricity and its uh, gas to, to Europe. It will bring Egypt in and the relation between us and Egypt will be different. And I believe that at the end, it might help economically the Palestinians as well. They have a little gas field near Gaza and if they will be smart enough to, um, to operate it through Israel because the infrastructure is too expensive to do it independently, um, that will bring them in and at the end, we can solve by this project the, um, the energy problem of Jordan, uh, which um, might be part of this um, alliance. And the, 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 I think that the opportunities are there. We have to invest in the infrastructure to connect us to Europe. And we have to build a structure which allows the countries to feel that they are benefiting from this alliances, all the countries, um, at least um, including um, uh, Greece, uh, uh, Egypt, Cyprus, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians. And then it can go even behind it, it can connect also Israel to France, which is very uh, strong against the um, uh, uh, Turks uh, attitude in the, in the Mediterranean. And Italy, which is hesitating, so um, I see it as a huge opportunity, although the attitude of Turkey towards this alliance is, is a huge uh, problematic one and we have to deal with it. And one of the, the fact that we are, that our um, Navy is growing and we are getting more and more capabilities in the sea is the clear understanding that we might, we might have to face um, uh, the Turkish uh, aggressiveness which up till now was limited to Greece and 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 uh, and, Tur and uh, Greece and, and Cyprus, they didn't act against Israelis only once. Um, so, but it is a problem. Though. It's a huge problem, but I think more opportunities than than, than challenges. Thank you, General. I'll now quickly hand over to Gary Hertz. If we can just keep our questions short so we can get through a few more before we're, uh, we're up for time. Uh, the issue of uh, Qatar and the uh, potential sales of the F-35 by the Americans, how much of a problem is that for Israel? Uh, at the end, if we can take history to teach us, there was not even one American modern airplane that Israel had, the, the Arab states didn't. Um, the last two examples is Saudi Arabia has um, F-15, as good as the Israeli one. And um, the Egyptians have F-16, as good as the Israel has. And it is true about F-16 in Iraq and F-16 in, in uh, in uh, Jordan. Uh, so um, we cannot prevent it. And we have to understand that it cannot be prevented. We never succeed sale of um, airplanes into uh, to the Arab states by the United States of America. We tried to prevent it when they wanted to sell the, the um, uh, intelligence um, AWAX airplane to to Saudi Arabia and the F-15, and we didn't succeed. Based on that assumption, what we have to do is to get from the Americans all uh, what is needed to mitigate the problem, to get some capabilities that we need and the, the Arab states do not have. It. It might be in software, it might be in uh, hardware, it might be in munition, it might be uh, communication, it might be uh, um, computers, whatever. We had 
a mechanism between us and the Americans. There is an American law, which um, according to which the administration has to report the house every year that Israel is keeping its qualitative edge. It means that the White House will have to go to the subcommittee of the Congress and say, we sold A, B, and C to Arab states, and because of that, the Israeli state got X, Y, and that. And this is the area in which we have to be very precise, uh, very determined, very professional, to come with the list to the Americans and say, okay, we understand that we cannot prevent you to sell, you know, in $3 billion F-35 to Qatar or, or the Emirates. It's not countries which fought with us. Countries which are, the Emirates are 2,000 kilometers away from Israel. But for us, it's very important because we don't want these capabilities to have in the hands of countries which might take part in a war against Israel or might provide information to other countries or in the information can might be leaked from these countries to other countries. And we have an agreement and you have a law that we will keep our qualitative edge. And it is part of it. And this is what Israel needs. And if we get our needs from the United States of America, it will um, bridge the problem that we are facing when they are determined to sell. And I understand economically why it cannot be prevented by us. And but at the same time, we are not losing our quality edge. This is an area in which we have to be very determined and very precise. And we have a history of these uh, negotiations and, and dialogue in the past. And it should be taken uh, part in the future. And I believe that the Americans will keep their promise that Israel will have the um, qualitative aid which is needed to compensate Israel for the asymmetry that Israel is facing. General, I'm going to, uh, I've got some questions in the chat and I know that we're a bit pressed for time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge three connected questions into one and hopefully you can give me some quick fire answers to these three quick points. Now they all relate to Turkey. In your presentation, you raised the uh, growing issues and concerns that, uh, that Israel faces with Turkey. So the first question relates to, on the one hand, the, the security issues with the freedom that Hamas has in Turkey and uh, the rhetoric uh, from Erdogan, uh, including other measures uh, in the uh, Mediterranean. But the, the, the Israelis, as you already mentioned, still travel to Turkey, even though a lot of them use Istanbul as a, as a gateway uh, to, to Asia. But there's still quite a lot of Israelis going and, and holidaying in Turkey. And there's a considerable amount of trade as well. So the first question vis-a-vis -vis Turkey is how does Israel reconcile the growing issues on the security and military front with a, a growing economic relationship and partnership as well. The second question uh, relates to Russia and it's either stabilizing or destabilizing uh, efforts in respect to both Turkey and Iran. So the second point is Russia's involvement in the region, specifically with Turkey as the other actor in Iran. And the third and also important uh, point is, do you think that Israel has any interest uh, in the uh, conflict in Azerbaijan, given Turkey's role in the conflict. So three very quick points. Israel's uh, interesting relationship, both on the military front on the one hand and economic on the other. The second point is Russia's involvement. And the third is, do you think that uh, Israel has any role in the conflict in Azerbaijan, given Turkey's role? I, I like all the three questions because it is another example why decisions in the high level of strategy are very complicated and there are no clear answer of yes and no. Uh, and, and, and even the, the, the old rule that my, the friend of my friend is my friend or the enemy of my enemy is my friend doesn't work. Not always, at least not always. Uh, you know, when the, the trade with, his, uh, with Turkey was tripled after the Marmara event, and we are uh, buying from Turkey more than Turkey is buying from us. The trade is favoriting the Turkish side. 
Um, but we don't have an interest to cut the relations with Turkey. We are flying over Turkey uh, to many places in the world. And we, we have our people in, 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 in Ankara and they have their embassy in, in, in Tel Aviv. And it is not the interest of Israel to cut the relations. Whenever we think that the, the Turks are too aggressive, we are very active to contain them. It, is, it was very clear when they sent the Marmara into the Gaza Strip. We didn't hesitate with all due respect to the, to the Turks. And even some Turks even, even had been killed by Israeli soldiers because we were very aggressive. The, the committee which investigated said that you know, we have all the rights from the international point of view, from the international law point of view to stop it, but we were too aggressive on the, on the ground. And we, we, we paid, I think, $10 billion to the families. But we killed Turkish citizens. Because when it is coming to defend ourselves, when we think Turkey is uh, too much um, threatening Israel, we don't hesitate. And we will do it in the future as well. And they know that we will do it in the future as well. So this is the Middle East. You have uh, more complicated relations. You keep the trade. You don't take out your embassy. But at the same time, you are very determined not to let the Turks to do what they want to do against Israel. More complicated situation will be if it will not be against Israel, but against Egypt. And, and we have interest that, that Egypt will win Libya and not Turkey will win Libya. How we are acting there. This is more complicated. And many actions will be taken under the table, under the radar screen. That is, will not bring us to confronting openly uh, Turkey. Yes, but Turkey is a problem. Turkey today is the, 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 the hub, not just of Israelis who are going outside, but also of Hamas, who are sending its agents inside. And um, I believe that at the end, that, that will not stop us fighting Hamas. The same is about Russia. Russia is, is, is not our responsibility. We, we cannot say to the Russians, don't be here. And we have um, 150 miles from Tel Aviv, uh, Russians' uh, bases of Air Force and Navy. And we, for us, it's like the weather. We have to take it into consideration to act, taking into account that the Russians are there, what they do here and there. We cannot influence the Russians' actions uh, against um, Turkey in one place and with the Iranians in other places. We have an open dialogue with Russia, and the Russians understand that we have strong interest in the future of Syria. We don't want the Iranians, and I'm not sure that the Russians want the Iranians there. We don't want the Iranians there, we don't want, and we will fight against the Iranians, and we will bomb their facilities. Um, and the Russians know that they should not be very close to the Iranians, because the Iranians are a legitimate target from the, from the Israeli point of view. So the Russians are there. We cannot change this effect on the ground. Um, we have very good dialogue with the Russians. It's not that we are succeeding all the time to influence them, but at least they understand what we are doing and why we are doing. And we have a hotline to prevent any mistakes. But Russia for us, it's like the weather. It's a fact. Azerbaijan is, is again a very interesting question. We don't have any interest in this war. We don't care who will control Nagorno-Karabakh. No. But we had and we have long relations with Azerbaijan, one of the few uh, Muslim countries which supported Israel. We are buying a lot of our oil from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan bought weapon system from Israel. And we knew when we sold it to the Zerbidan, it might one day they might use it. You cannot be, um, you know, people are calling for hypocrisy to say, well, we'll stop uh, selling the Zerbidan. No, we cannot, because Israel will not be trusted by other countries. And we will stop when those countries are using what they bought from us. So Israel does not have any interest or um, idea who should control Nagorno-Karabakh. But Israel 
had and has and will continue to have in the future good relations with um, Azerbaijan. Do, are we happy from the fact that Turkey will be stronger in the future because they are very much involved there directly, not like Israel just by selling weapon system, but directly Turkish soldiers are fighting there? The, the answer is no, but it, it's not in our hands. Do we want to have good relations in the future with uh, Romania as well? The answer is yes, but I'm not sure that it can be achieved. So here we have a country, Azerbaijan, which unlike all odds was um, um, strong enough and courageous enough to have good relations with the Jewish state when it was very unique in the Muslim world, uh, supplied us with oil, both with the system from us, and we intend to keep these relations in the future as well. Um, we hope that we are not losing Armenia by that, but we cannot prevent the Iranian, the Armenians from, right? We understand, I understand their point of view, but they have to understand our point of view. Thank you, General. I'm now gonna hand over to Jeremy Jones for the last question. And I do apologize. I do see some hands that are raised. Unfortunately, we have run out of time and I apologize for that. Uh, I'll now, now hand over to Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the webinar. I'm just concluding with the last couple of questions. There's actually one question, but it's about two different phone calls. You receive a phone call from the new president or the newly reelected president next week. He says to you, I want to do the right thing by Israel and by the US and security. What should my priorities be on coming to office? And then you receive another phone call from the Prime Minister of Australia. And he says, as a good global citizen and as somebody with our own concerns, what can we be doing to contribute towards peace and security? Uh, with America, it's very easy. We have very strong relations in with American uh, military intelligence institutions. Uh, America is providing Israel with a $3.8 billion a year. Um, Israel, America is supporting Israel in the United Nations. And um, the, the easy answer to the question without going into details is, Mr. President, we want to continue and to enhance these relations with the institutions of the United States of America, with the um, to, uh, that you continue to provide us with the ability to, to buy with American money um, uh, new technologies and weapon systems in, in America and to continue to help Israel uh, in the international community when Israel is facing many uh, uh, problems. There is one um, question that we will not ask. We will never ask the Americans to defend the state of Israel. Israel want to, do, to be in a position, and this is the, 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 the basis of our relations with the United States of America. Israel want to be in a position to defend itself by itself. And we hope that the Americans, the American people, the American administration, uh, with the support of the, of the House, uh, of the uh, Congress, will give Israel whatever is needed to the ability of Israel to defend itself by itself. This is the conversation with the president of the United States of America. To continue and to enhance, and the goal is very clear. With Australia, it's, we, we don't expect Australia to provide us with, with, with the, um, with the uh, weapon systems or so. From Australia, we expect two things. One, to help Israel in the international community. We need countries as Australia um, to help Israel in the international community. In meeting of the G20, that someone will speak on behalf of Israel. In the meetings of the um, countries in the, in, in, in the uh, Pacific, that Australia will be a uh, determined ally of Israel, speaking on behalf of Israel, what how to help Israel and how to promote the relations between all the other countries with Israel. This is one area in which we need Australia. And the second one is the relations with Australia itself. We can make a lot more by cooperating with Australia. 
I had in mind many years ago, I spoke with, I think with Colin about it, to find something which is equivalent to the joint venture that we have with the Americans to build together something big, which will be important for the defense of Australia and the capabilities of Israel. Something like that, that will make the good relations between the two countries even more stronger in the future and will be understood by everyone in Australia and in Israel that this is an alliance which will continue in the future as it was in the in the past. And here we have to find um, areas in which we can cooperate and to bring to both sides um, as many uh, benefits as, as, as possible. These are the two areas in which we need Australia, in the international community and joint venture that we can work together um, to provide both sides um, the benefits which they can get, if it, they can get from this uh, project. Thank you very much, General. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's webinar. Uh, General, on behalf of AJAC, it was a splendid analysis and we thank you so much for your time.